I think it'll come as no surprise to you that the complexities of the problems we're facing as organizations and as societies are growing. And that means the complexities of the solutions needed are growing too. To find those solutions, we're going to have to be creative. And that means we're going to have to bring together people from different fields to work together, and we're going to have to trust and rely on each other's expertise. The days of one person having all the answers are long gone. But for people to feel enabled and empowered to be creative, they've got to be able to trust their colleagues. The problem there is trust can often be something of a double-edged sword. Right? The reason humans trust each other is because we can accomplish more working together than we ever could alone. But when we do choose to trust someone, there's a risk. Right? We're making ourselves vulnerable. One way we do that is by relying on other people's competencies. Right? Do these people have the skills and the knowledge needed to accomplish the task? If they don't, the team is in trouble. But in some ways, that's an easier nut to crack because we're pretty good at assessing knowledge and, and competence. The other way trust matters is when it comes to integrity. Whenever two people work together, there's always the chance that one may choose to act selfishly for advantage. So here, in this case, that might mean keeping information to yourself so that you can then give it out and, and raise yourself in status. It might be condemning another person's idea because they came up with a potentially creative solution that turned out not to work, and so you try and raise yourself up by selling them out. And whether you realize it or not, your mind is always making these calculations. So the question is, which is the better way to go? Should we trust and cooperate or be selfish? Martin Noack, who's an evolutionary biologist at Harvard, has some wonderful simulations that shows Success depends on time scale. In the short term, acting selfishly can allow you to get ahead. But in the long term, and that's what most of us care about, it's teams that share and cooperate and support each other that have the best outcomes. And so that, of course, raises the question of what can we do to increase trust in teams so that people can feel free and comfortable to be creative and to fail initially and go on? But to answer that question, you have to be willing to accept the idea that trustworthiness isn't a stable trait. You know, we all kind of have this idea growing up that, uh, this common motif, that growing up there's an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other. And if you listen to the angel, you're going to grow up and be a good person. You'll be trustworthy. Everything will be great. There's only one problem with that, and that is the data. If you look at scientific data on people's cooperation, moral behavior, et cetera, what you see is people's behavior is a lot more variable than any of us might have expected. And that raises the, the importance of figuring out what are the situational cues and situational nudges we can institute to make people want to trust each other more and work together. So let me um, give you an example of just how situational dependent trustworthiness might be. So in my lab, we often do um, experiments, and we don't ask people what they would do, because if I say to you, are you going to be trustworthy, what would you do? You'll say yes, even though some of you know you might not be. But what I think is more likely is that you'll say yes, because you think you will. But when push comes to shove and real costs and benefits are on the line, things change. So we bring people into the lab, and we say, OK, um, there's two tasks that need to be done, a really short, fun one and a really long, onerous one. Um, here's a virtual coin flipper. You can flip the coin to decide which one of these you're going to get. The photo hunt that's fun, the logic problems that are long and bad. The problem is the guy sitting next to you in the hall before you came in, he's getting whichever one you don't do. And then we leave them alone. They, at least they think. They're on hidden video. What do you think people do? Well, I will tell you, some people don't flip the coin, or, or they do what I think is more interesting. They, 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 they flip the virtual coin, which we always set to come up tails so they get the bad task. And <laughs> they don't like it, and so they flip it again. And they flip it again. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you roll the dice and you get the wrong roll. You're like, wait, 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 no, I need a do-over. What percentage of people do you think cheated on this task? 90. Now, we've done it many times, so it's not like I was running this experiment outside, outside the prison or something. Um, sometimes it's 87%, sometimes it's 92 These are all good people. And if we ask our pool ahead of time, is this the right thing to do, you know, flip the coin? It's the only time I get unanimous data. Everybody says, if you don't flip the coin, you're, you're cheating, you're doing something wrong. Yet 90% of them do it. These are good, upstanding people. How does that happen? Um, afterward, we ask them, 
so how fairly did you behave? How trustworthy did you behave? Higher numbers mean more trustworthy. When people are judging themselves, they say, oh yeah, I did okay. You know, this is 3.5 is the midpoint, so they're above the midpoint. I did okay. If you run the same experiment again, but you have people watch somebody else go through it, so we have an actor who doesn't flip the coin and looks like he's cheating. How fairly did he act? Nah, he didn't do as well. Right? Now this is the essence of hypocrisy, right? It's the same thing, yet we cut ourselves slack. So the problem is, how do we deal with this? How do we get rid of this problem? Well, to, to answer that, we need to know where it comes from. So what gives people the self-control to be trustworthy? Is it going to be a cognitive mechanism, or is it going to be kind of an emotional, intuitive mechanism, system one or system two, if you're Danny Kahneman? Well, to answer that question again, we, we, sorry, we ran the experiment again, but this time at the end, when we asked people, how fairly did you act? You put them under what's called a, a cognitive load, which means you have to kind of remember these random digits while you're asking questions. What that does is it ties up your memory, your, your executive function, so you can't really rationalize and think about things. So how fairly did I act? Seven, eight, six, five, five, I acted, boom, and then you have to report the numbers. What happens here? Well, now, here's the data from before. And... Under cognitive load, right, hypocrisy goes away. The only bar that's different from any of the others is this. So if we don't allow you to engage in rationalization, what's happening is you know what you did is wrong, right? If we give you a few minutes to think about it, your conscious mind comes in and it, go, it overrides that pang of guilt. It says, oh, well, you know, there was a reason why I did this, and it whitewashes it away. Um, and that's why most of the people create a story. They'll say things like, well, I normally wouldn't have done it, but you know, I had an appointment I couldn't be late for or whatever it is. But they, I in washing it away, we actually don't realize how untrustworthy we can be and that causes a problem. Just by giving people the anonymity here, it made them want to, why not take the short-term benefit? There's no long-term cost, no one will know. So because we think guilt might have been pushing the other way, we're thinking about, well, what might increase people's um, willingness to be trustworthy. And I, in my lab, we study a lot of moral emotions, and one emotion we look at a lot is gratitude. And so we, re we decided to run a study where we could see if we made people feel grateful, would they actually be more trustworthy? Um, and so we brought people into the lab, because I like to do things in real time, and we had them sit down at a computer, and they were doing this god-awful onerous task. And as they worked on it, the computer was rigged to crash, and they're like, oh, you have to start all over from the beginning and they don't really want to do this. At that point, somebody comes over to them and says, another person who's an actor, and says, oh, that didn't happen to me. Let me see if I can help you. Hits a key, surreptitiously the computer starts to come back on. Lo and behold, said subject is very grateful that they don't have to do this god-awful task um, again. And we compare that to a condition where um, the computer doesn't break and they're just kind of feeling rather neutral. And then we have them play this trust game, which is kind of like a prisoner's dilemma, for those of you who know prisoner's dilemma, um, except it allows you to cheat a little bit instead of just completely defecting or cooperating. Um, the way the game works is each person has four tokens. Tokens are worth a dollar to you, but, but two dollars to someone else, and you can exchange them. And so um, you have to decide how many you want to exchange. So if you want to be untrustworthy, what you try and do is convince the other person to give you all of their tokens and then don't give them any, which means you now have $12 and they have none. The best cooperative solution that's trustworthy is we each exchange all, everything we had and now we're making eight. So we can share profit or I can screw you over and make a lot more and you have nothing. What do people do? Well, the design here um, is we have them either feeling grateful because the person helped them or the computer didn't break and they feel neutral and they're going to play this economic game with that person or they're going to play it with a complete stranger. So the more they give here means they're more, they're either behaving more trustworthy. What you find is, well, when they're feeling grateful, they act more trustworthy than when they're feeling neutral. And you might say, well, that's not surprising. This person just helped them. Of course they're going to do that. They think this person is trustworthy or they owe them something. What happens when they play a stranger that they've never met and are told they never will meet? Same thing, right? How much they give is also directly predicted in a linear way by how grateful they feel. Any subject who felt more grateful for the help paid it forward to the stranger and gave that person more. And what this suggests is that if you can induce feelings of gratitude in people, it automatically makes them want to behave in a more trustworthy, more um, empathic way to build a team. We've done it with helping behavior and lots of other things as well, not just money. So what this suggests, right, is that if we, can, if we can increase moral emotions in people, we find similar things with compassion and empathy as well, within a group, it's going to nudge them automatically 
to want to be more trustworthy, to be more cooperative, to support each other, have those long-term gains. The problem now, though, right, is people are working remotely, asynchronously. They're not working face-to-face, -face, right? How do we have that emotional contagion going back and forth, right? People use emoticons, why? Because it's the world's most simplistic, worst way of trying to indicate some emotion in some email that you're sending. We need to do it better. Um, so the question is, how can people figure out they can trust someone using new technologies? Well, there's a lot of work out there looking at what are, how do you tell if someone is trustworthy, right? People have been looking for this forever, the TSA, you can, you can name it, you know, is it, is it the smile, is that the golden cue, is it the eyes, is it, is it whatever? In none of those things, right? TSA spent $40 million in a program devised by Paul Ekman for microexpression. Didn't work. The problem is expressions have to be, to understand them, they're going to be subtle and dynamic. That is, you're not going to broadcast if you're trustworthy just like that, because then you can be taken advantage of. They're going to be very context dependent. This is the problem with a lot of technologies right now. They don't pay attention to context. And features are going to uh, occur in sets. The only way you're going to understand what a simple thing, like if I'm touching my face, does that mean I'm nervous or does that mean I have an itch? If all you're looking at is touching my face, you can't tell. You need to kind of look at it in a context, a constraint satisfaction way. So let me just give you an example of why all the software that's designed to read people's faces is problematic. What is this person feeling? Hmm? Pain, fear, sorrow, victory, right? If you just look at the face in terms of the in terms of everything we know about facial features based on the basic emotions, that ain't happy. This is, and we can do it with lots of things. And so what we're seeing in science now, so my, one of my day jobs is editor for the journal Emotion, and so I'm trying to resolve all these debates and the papers coming in. What we're knowing is face is not very good, right? Except for if people are smiling, you can tell they're happy. Beyond that, it's not very good. And there are no expressions for gratitude or compassion or empathy. To understand what a person is feeling, the body becomes very important, and the context behind it becomes hugely important. And so all the software out there that's based on faces alone, especially for more complex states, is not going to work very well. So we decided to figure out, can we figure out if people are trustworthy? And so we kind of threw out everything we thought we knew and started from the ground up. We wanted to identify cues, and we wanted to demonstrate that there's some accuracy. And then to show that we were right, we wanted to manipulate those cues and see if we could push people's judgments around about what is trustworthy and what isn't. So you can think of it as an exploratory and a confirmatory phase. So we brought people um, into the lab and go away for phase one. Um, what are the candidates for trust-related signals? The way it worked is you come in and you are um, 86 folks came in. The only thing was they couldn't know each other. We broke them into 43 dyads. Um, they were going to talk for five minutes to get to know each other. And then they were going to play this game for money, that same game I showed you before, the give some game. And they could talk about anything they wanted. We gave them a list of topics to get going. And so you're, after that, we separate them. Uh, oh, sorry. While they're doing this, we're, we're, we have three cameras on them, so we're time syncing everything that they do so we can video lock it and look at their expressions. Um, some people are doing it face to face. Some people are doing it, uh, they're having their get to know you conversation over the net. The reason why is, Semantic information is the same. Here you have nonverbal exposure. Here you don't. Then we separate them, and they go and play that give some game to see how trustworthy they're going to be. But we're also asking them to predict what you think your partner is going to do, that person you were just talking with. And what we find is that actual giving was the same in both conditions. So the average level of trustworthiness was the same whether or not you, were, uh, you had talked face-to-face -face or remotely. But predictions, right, for what the other person was going to do, these are absolute values of errors, were significantly better when you had access to their nonverbals than when you didn't, which means people were picking up on something that allowed them to predict ground truth. What? So we built all kinds of models with lots of different, um, all different cues that we could measure and think of. And what came out as the best set of predictors were four cues taken together. On their own, they didn't predict, but taken together, they did. Right, so crossing your arms and leaning away, what do those kind of signal? Well, usually that means I don't really want to affiliate with you. I don't like you. Hand touching and face touching, those kind of usually go around with being nervous. So what's the gestalt here? Um, 
I don't like you and I'm kind of nervous because I'm going to screw you over in a minute. <laughs> so um, what you see here is um, people were asked to judge what their partner did or how untrustworthy their partner acted. So the, the higher the number means the more trustworthy people were. The more often any person um, you saw your partner emit these cues, the less trustworthy you predicted that person was going to be. And in fact, the more any person did emit these cues, the more untrustworthy they were. And so we actually have some level of ground truth here in being able to predict what people were going to do. The interesting thing though, of course, nobody had any idea what their mind was doing. People couldn't verbalize this, yet their intuitions were telling them. But how do I know that it's actually those cues and not like when I touch my face, my left pupil is dilating and that's the magic cue? You need to control exactly what people are doing. The problem is you can't do that with a human. Imagine if you were trying to have a conversation and I told you, okay, now cross your arms, now do this through your earphone. You're trying, there's no way you can do that and carry on a normal conversation. But you can do it with a robot. So this is uh, Nexi the robot who um, was designed by my collaborator Cynthia Brazil at MIT's Media Lab. And so what we did was train this system with human biological motion, right? Because if you're an engineer and you want to say, robot, pick up something, it's going to go like this, it's going to spin its hand and do something really weird. That doesn't work. We needed to train it based on true human biological motion because that's what the brain is going to use. And so we ran the same experiment except we replaced the person with a robot. So now you're talking to the robot. Um, robot, it's called the Wizard of Oz paradigm because we're controlling the robot behind the curtain <laughs> in another room. Um, the way it works is with this following setup. This person is the voice of the robot, so she can see the ro here you can see the person you're gonna to talk to through the cameras in the robot's eyes. There's a camera on her head, so as she moves her head in real time, the robot's head moves in real time. As she speaks, it picks up the phonemes and the robot's mouth moves in real time. The only thing she doesn't control is whether the robot is giving you those untrustworthy cues or something else, because we didn't want any non-conscious bias to come in. So this person controls whether or not Nexi gives those, like crossing your arms, touching his face, untrustworthy cues or similar cues that weren't related to trustworthiness. And this person controls when the robot freaks out because 10% of the time something goes wrong and it does something weird. <laughs> it's a problem of cutting edge technology, right? Um, so we brought in 65 people, 31 of them uh, were assigned to the, to the condition where you get the trustworthy cues, the others weren't. They would, uh, so here's Nexi crossing its arms. Here it is touching his face. I'm gonna show you the video. So first you have to get people used to the fact that they're talking to a robot because there's this minute of, oh my God, I'm talking to a robot. So there's this part where they are getting to know each other. Go. So my name's Nexi. What's your name? My name's Kim. Kim, it's yeah. very nice to meet you. You too. To get us started today, why don't I tell you a little bit about myself? We had to put this, this bar here because people were worried the robot was going to roll over to them. So, so as you can see, she's a little nervous. But as time goes on, people have a normal conversation. They start self-disclosing. And in case you want to see it head on, here's what it looks like. A big open room. There are lots of cords and gadgets. So it's probably not like your house, but it's home for me. Why don't you tell me about where you're from? Well, I was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and uh, I have a residency in Summerville right now. I've been there for the past months. So. Then they're told, now you're going to play this game with the robot. The robot has an artificial intelligence algorithm that it's going to make predictions based on the conversation with you, blah, blah, no, it doesn't have that. But people believe that it does, and so they had to predict what they wanted to do in this trust game with the robot and answer some questions about it. And so um, what we see, those of you who are quant folks, this is a kind of a regression model. Um, if people saw the cues, the untrustworthy cues, they thought that the, they rated the robot as less trustworthy. They didn't rate it as less likable, which is important to me because we all have friends who we like but wouldn't trust with our money. And so it lets me know that it's actually targeted to trust. And the more untrustworthy you thought the robot was, the more, uh, the less you predicted she would give you and the less you gave 
to the robot itself. And so what this shows is that the human mind is willing to ascribe moral intent and emotional responses to technological entities if they're human enough. It doesn't be perfectly human, right? But they're human enough. And so what that suggests is you may not get it here, but you will get it here. Now, while he's not humanoid, human, human, it's humanoid, but it has enough of the features that it can evoke emotional responses. So the question for us is, if you're in a situation where the boss is a robotic avatar, this is useful. If it's not, okay, it's not. But what it suggests is, how do we take these cues into the platforms we have? And what's going to be important in understanding that is figuring out the way to present them in a way that the mind is used to and can make use of in its normal currency and normal systems. And I think that's one of the things we're going to need to talk about, think about going forward. Thank you.